The Tom Woods Show, episode 1912. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Hey folks, Tom Woods here. Well, with this episode, we're kicking off a week that we may as well call something like Thomas Jefferson Week because we're going to be talking about some important themes in the thought of Thomas Jefferson, but we're not going to be talking exclusively about Jefferson himself. So we'll talk about federalism and decentralization and state nullification of unconstitutional federal laws and topics like that with two different guests. The first few episodes will feature our old friend Brian McClanahan, and then after that, we're going to talk once again to our old friend Marco Bassani of the University of Milan. So we're going to begin with Brian McClanahan, who happens to be a faculty member at libertyclassroom.com, which is my dashboard university where you can learn the history and economics they kept from you in school. I'm delighted to have Brian as part of that project. He's the author of many books and is the host of The Brian McClanahan Show. His most recent book, appropriately enough, is The Jeffersonian Tradition. Brian, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, Tom. Appreciate it. I want to take a few days to talk about your new book, The Jeffersonian Tradition. It's full of classic McClanahan, which means it's full of material nobody was ever taught. And that's what I specialize in on the Tom Woods Show, so it's just tailor-made for me. Let's start off with the obvious question. How would you define the Jeffersonian tradition? Well, I think the best way to define it in terms of our modern political situation is a reverence for federalism. And if you look at where we are today in modern American society and look at all the problems that we have, one of the things we constantly talk about is this relationship between the federal government and the states. And just think about the COVID fiasco, right? I mean, in places like Florida where you live or Alabama where I live, life continued pretty much like normal this last year and a half or so, but it didn't for a lot of people. And that's because of this federal structure and we're seeing it now. This is, this is where we have federalism as part of the American political process. So I think when you talk about Jeffersonian tradition, you have to look at this decentralization issue and, and how federalism plays into that. And of course, also the, the corollary to that, and it's something that we lose or we've lost really in the last half century is the agrarian tradition and how important that was to at least early American society. We have far fewer farmers today than we've ever had. But of course, on the other side of that, you have a lot of people that are becoming interested in this idea of you know, sustainable agriculture and local farms and local produce and you know, you're buying your meat from somebody you know or buying your produce from somebody you know and getting out of the big factory farms. So there's a lot to this other than just politics, but it's certainly a, a way of looking at the world as small. You know, Jefferson was interested in small, taking care of your backyard, your back porch, sweeping your back porch first. And I think that's something we need to think about moving forward in modern American society. You mentioned COVID, and I have to say that in the midst of this, even though you and I constantly complain about the more or less disappearance of federalism, we have seen that even through all of it, federalism is still resilient. Because as you say, I have a completely different lifestyle in Florida from somebody in Michigan or California. In fact, so different that I think there are people in Michigan and California who don't even know how I live who don't even know that people have just been doing ordinary things for months and months now. I think there are people in other countries who don't know this. So does that warm your heart in some way that the governors were doing things in, defi I mean, obviously even the governor of Georgia was scolded by Trump. And obviously some of these red state governors are not exactly Joe Biden's favorite people either. They got away with it. Right, I think it's great. I mean, I remember back early on last year, I emailed Michael Malice, of course, who's living in New York City. And I just asked him, how are you doing? Because I knew that it was so bad there. And he said, you know, it's it's pretty bad. And I felt terrible because I said, for us, you know, nothing really has changed. And it was, <laughs> I thought about it after I wrote it. And I thought, gosh, that was just rubbing salt in the wounds <laughs> because, you know, for us in, in Alabama, we could go and do just about anything we wanted. You know, schools had had shut down. We, we can talk about how all that worked. But you know, if you wanted to go to the store, you had to wear a mask. They forced you to do that. But otherwise, you could go out and you could go to restaurants, you could go to stores, you could do just about anything you wanted. And some people are just still suffering. And 
it does warm my heart to that because I think people are waking up to this. Hey, you know, if I really want to live a particular lifestyle, well, I'll just move to a state that's like that. I mean, look at the amount of people moving to Texas or Florida, two states that have, uh, you know, been pretty much open. The taxes are low. There's no income tax, a state income tax in Florida or Texas. And so that's a great thing. But people are looking at options around the United States and saying, I want to live somewhere that better reflects my worldview. And who wants to live in California? Now, I know that you know, Michael Bolden likes living in California. I mean, he's, he's the exception, I think, <laughs> to people that we know. But I think that it's, it's really interesting how this works. And this is Jeffersonianism being realized in modern America. So the state, the central state, the United States, not states, but state, is becoming uh, problematic for so many Americans who are looking for some way out of this. And I think that's something that's interesting about what COVID has actually done. I'm going to skip over a couple of things I was planning to talk about because of what you just said. Let's get right to, you have a chapter in here called The United States is, parentheses are, not a nation. Right. Now, I mean, what does that mean? Well, if you look at the traditional definition of a nation, it's a singular state. And it's a state that's comprised, if you go back to a 19th century definition of nation, of a people that are homogenous, essentially. And we know that's not the case in the United States. We know even among the early American settlers from England, that you had different cultures that were coming here, and we had people that were different in New England than there were in Virginia. And so we saw this cultural conflict very early on. And of course, that then has grown into other things as we've had more and more immigration from other parts of the world. And federalism helps solve that problem because you could have a California that is uh, different from a Georgia or different from a New York or a Michigan, And it can reflect the political culture of the people who live in that state. And so we have this real problem of nationalism in America. We have the American state. We have the central authority. One size fits all government. And I think that's the real issue. If you look at why people are so angry in America today, it's because they think that those people from that other state, be it California, New York, if you're living in real America, which is where you and I live. But if you're talking about California, New York, and we're being governed by California, New York, Well, people in the rest of the United States hate it because we have a national structure. Even Trump, you look at the the right and you look at how interested they become in nationalism in the last, say, four or five years, Trump called himself a nationalist. And so this is where we have this, this back and forth between the nationalists. You've got those on the right, those on the left, thinking that the government, the central authority has to do X, Y, and Z, and that we need to force this down people's throats. And so when you think of the United States as not a nation, Well, that's the Jeffersonian principle. It allows for all this flexibility. It allows for the states to do what they want. You can have your socialized utopia in California, and I don't have to pay for it in Alabama, or you don't have to pay for it in Florida. And then Florida can do what they want, too. If they want to have no masks and we want to slaughter people, as the left thinks, you know, in in Florida, and people are just dying in the streets from COVID everywhere, well, they can do that, too. You know, so... I mean, it, of course, that's not happening. But we know that this this allows for people to have a lifestyle in which they want to live. And and by saying the United States is a nation, we're going so far away from the original Jeffersonian vision of America that uh, I think it's just distorting what the United States was meant to be, a federal republic. And that's the key to defining what the United States is still, a federal republic. It's not a singular republic, but a federal republic. I w- always... I was kind of partial to Calhoun's remark, there's no such thing as the American people. And now, I know that we say that as a shorthand, the American people think such and such. And by the way, it's a dumb thing to say because the so-called American people do not think with one brain. <laughs> that's, that's clear enough. But what instead we have are the peoples of the various states. So we have the people of Virginia, the people of Massachusetts, the people of Pennsylvania, We don't have the American people for precisely the reasons you mentioned. And unfortunately, this kind of stuff that we're talking about here that's rooted in the the compact theory of the union of which Jefferson was such an articulate proponent is very much lost in some of the conventional conservative accounts of the Constitution and of early America, where you you normally get Hamilton light when you read what they have to say. And uh, I want McClanahan. I don't want, I don't want Hamilton Light. I want McClanahan, Jefferson, Abel Upshur, and St. George Tucker, and, and other people people have not been encouraged to read or even to have heard of. Absolutely. I mean, if you, if you think about that idea of the American people, there was a, it was John Taylor of Caroline said that it's like saying there's a utopia for utopians. 
It just doesn't exist. There's, there's nothing there. And I mean, we say this to our detriment, the American people, because it doesn't allow, and think about from a libertarian perspective, you're just talking about libertarians, the idea of not forcing someone else to live the way you want. It's an imperialist message to say there's an American people and we're all this singular thing and this is what we're all going to do. Well, that doesn't always work. And we know it doesn't work a lot. And so it actually allows for less conflict when you have this greater diversity of states being able to do what they want and the people of the states doing what they want. And of course, the argument against this is always, well, but you're going to have segregation and you're going to have all the... Well, come on now. We're, we're living in 2021. I don't know of anybody who wants to bring back segregation, except for the left. I mean, they certainly do in many ways. But, you know, it's the, the idea that we're going to have somehow, we're going to get this creation of these states that are going to just oppress people and do all these horrible things in certain ways. I just don't think it's going to happen. Now, I mean, I guess it could. There, there's always that possibility. But where has the central government been any better on some of these things over time? And certainly when you look at uh, the idea of this, you say Hamilton light, I think it's also Lincolnian. I mean, this is this this is Lincolnian nationalism. And you look at I've, I've been excoriated by the neoconservatives here recently for saying having the audacity to say that uh, we shouldn't uh, have this kind of a uh, one size fits all national government, and that Lincoln is a problem with his uh, proposition nation theory. But the fact is, when you come from that perspective, well, then you're gonna you're going to force this type of conflict on Americans because. Certain percentage of the population, we're at 50, 50%, you know, it's 50% one way, 50% the other way. You're going to have 50% of the population opposing everything you do. And we're going to see how that results in massive conflict when we see it on a daily basis now. So, I mean, I don't know why people wouldn't be receptive to this, except for that they are sick and they, they want to make everybody else live like they do. And they can't stand it if somebody isn't. I mean, this is, it's almost a mental disorder. Well, I hear you. I definitely hear you. Hey, everybody, let's take a minute to thank our sponsor, BetterHelp. And I want to speak directly to people out there who are silently suffering. And that could be because of depression or anxiety or stress or countless other reasons. We've all been there. And sometimes we don't reach out for help because maybe we're not confident anybody can help us or we don't deserve help or we should fight this on our own or we're embarrassed to ask for help. Well, how's that been working out for you? I want to urge you to make a change, to join the war for your own happiness. And BetterHelp is an excellent way to do that. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed professional therapist. You can schedule weekly video or phone sessions. You can send messages to your counselor. And if somehow this counselor is not a good match for you, BetterHelp makes it easy and free to change counselors if you need to. And you'll find among the experts at BetterHelp a broad range of expertise that might not be available in your local area. And that's just another thing that makes BetterHelp such an excellent solution, not to mention it's convenient, professional, and affordable. And in fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. I want you to start living a happier life today. As a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com woods. Join over 1 million people taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash woods. Let's talk for a minute about the Declaration of Independence because that's one of the things people associate with Jefferson and you have a couple of pieces in here about that. A lot of times people think of the Declaration in terms of just the first paragraph, the, the words they've heard repeated over and over. They don't really know much else. Some people may know that it's a laundry list of particulars of uh, grievances that the Americans have. But to me, the significant thing about the Declaration really is the well, actually, I, why am I poisoning the well, or not poisoning the well, but I, I don't want to steal your thunder. What's significant about the Declaration of Independence? Why does it matter? And what does Jefferson mean when he talks about all men being created equal? What does he mean by that? There's been a lot of dispute about that. That's the loaded phrase. I mean, this is where you have the right, the proposition nation people that say that this is the most important part of the Declaration. And, you know, Harry Jaffa was uh, the one who really made that a key component of American conservatism back in the 1960s. And before that, nobody thought of that. I mean, nobody considered Lincoln to be a conservative for articulating what he did in the Gettysburg Address. And, and But Harry Jaffa made it that way. And of course, you had Joe Biden stand up the other day and say, the United States is an idea. It's all an idea. So you have this, this belief that somehow that first line of the second paragraph, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, is somehow the basis of the United States. Jefferson himself downplayed it. 
And we know that because, of course, he didn't really believe fundamentally that people were equal. I mean, he said it as much in the notes in the state of Virginia. He said that there, you know, he believed that people of different races were unequal. And, of course, that's something we don't agree with today. But that's what he said. We also know that Jefferson downplayed it late in life. He said, well, look, this is just kind of an expression of the American mind. I mean, we weren't saying anything new. These are just things we, we thought. And it was all part of a process to gain independence. And so Jefferson himself was saying the entire point of the declaration was simply to gain independence and express how we thought we would be independent. So when you look at what the founding generation said about that, that phrase and how they operate, action also means something. They didn't necessarily mean that there was equity, that people had to have equal everything. They certainly believed that people were equal under the law. And this is what Adams and Hamilton said. I mean, if you just want to go back to a couple of people outside of Virginia, but that people were equal under the law, essentially the rights of Englishmen. If you were a citizen, you were, had equal rights. Now, that could mean that there were non-citizens that didn't have equal rights. I mean, they, they fully recognize that. But we've taken it in a whole other direction in America today that we have this idea of equity, that everyone has to be the same in condition, that everyone has the same everything. That's just not what the founding generation thought about it. And when you start using that word equality, and particularly with a capital E instead of a lowercase e, you run into that situation. So this idea that you know people are equal, certainly Jefferson believed in a natural aristocracy, so did Hamilton. There were certainly people with other talents that could ex do great things. I mean, if we're all equal, then I should be able to join up uh, the, the and play NFL football, right? I mean, I should just walk on. I can go play football because we're all equal. Well, we know that's not the case. We know that I, I can't go build rockets because I, I'm, I'm just not capable of doing that. So there are people that are unequal and have certain natural talents. And I think that's what the founding generation was getting at more than anything else. But certainly this idea of equality under the law was important when you look at this revolutionary process as well. You know, the founders were not being treated equally under the law. I mean, they thought that there was a violation of the British Constitution. So there's all of that. Now, as far as your second question about what Jefferson thought was the most important part, that certainly had to be the last paragraph where he said that we have free and independent states and we're equal to the state of Great Britain. So there's that idea of equality again, but we're equal to the state of Great Britain. And so Virginia was the same as Great Britain, is the same as Massachusetts, is the same as France. And so that was the key. It was an independence document. As Pauli Meyer said, it was a defounding document. It wasn't a founding document. They were creating, they were breaking from the British and setting up these 13 independent states, but it wasn't a, a governing document. You can't use the declaration in a court of law. It didn't form a central authority. It didn't do anything except say we're independent and that was it. And that's the key to understanding the declaration, that whole principle of independence, a secession document. If we don't understand that, we really don't understand the declaration. And of course, the use of free and independent states, right. which the trouble with that is that in the American kind of lexicon, a state means some territorial jurisdiction that's subordinate to the center. But that's not what states meant when Jefferson used it. A state was something like Spain. You know, that, that was a state. And so to say that these are free and independent states means we have a collection of sovereignties here. We have, we have sovereign peoples in each of these territories. And, and that means something. That means something for the future of America and how we should understand our own country. Now, you have a, a piece in here saying that, in, in effect, we don't need a declaration of independence. Now, what, what do you mean by that? Well, that was actually said later on in American history. We need no declaration of independence. And I'm talking about moving forward into the 1860s. And it was uh, a sentiment that was there expressed by some Southerners who said, look, I mean, there, there was this question at that particular time. Do we need to have, if you're talking about secession, another declaration of independence? And uh, the answer was no, we don't need it because we've already done that. It was already done for us. And so we already have our independent states. The idea of the declaration was to assert that we had independent states. If we already have that recognized situation, all we need to do is say we no longer accede to the Constitution. We secede from that document and we just resume the powers of our states that are already there. They already exist. So we need no declaration of independence in that particular way. This is a powerful argument. If you're saying that the declaration created these 13 sovereign states, I mean, this is where they, they operate this way. They assert their independence. And uh, what happens to that sovereignty? It doesn't go away. It doesn't disappear. You can't, you can't just lose sovereignty. You can't give that up. 
And even in the Constitution, they didn't do that. They delegated certain powers to the center, meaning they had the authority to do it to begin with. So that would mean they're sovereign. So all they're doing is saying, we're resuming those powers that we delegated, and we're back to being our free and independent self. We don't need to have some type of declaration from the center because that's not necessary when we've already done it once. Our forefathers already did it. So if we're talking about modern secession, and this is something that people like to discuss, well, you wouldn't really need a declaration at that point. You would just say, okay, we're resuming the powers that we have under, under the idea that these are things that were granted to us in 1776, this idea we're free and independent states. And Jefferson recognized that future states would be admitted as equal states on equal footing with the existing states. So in other words, just because these states weren't recognized, you know, Illinois wasn't part of the original founding, it was admitted on as an equal state on equal status as the other states. So it had the same structure, it had the same rights as the other states, and the people of those states did as well. So they don't have to have a declaration of independence either. This is usually an argument. Well, I mean, the 13 states can say they could, they could secede, but not only in the West. I mean, they can't do it. Maybe Texas, but other than that, no one else. But that's completely ridiculous. I mean, Jefferson made it clear that this was not going to be the case when you started looking at how these new states would be formed out of the Western territories. You know, when we were talking about the Declaration, I forgot to mention something. I could have sworn I had done an episode on the, the Harry Jaffa and Mel Bradford debate on equality as a conservative principle. And the closest I can find is episode number 114. And given that this is episode 1912, I think a <laughs> revisiting of this question is a little bit overdue uh, with Marshall DeRosa. So I'll just say right now that coming up at some point between now and the end of the world, I'll try and do an episode about a very important exchange of articles back and forth, a debate that occurred in the pages of Modern Age, which is now edited by our friend and frequent guest Dan McCarthy, between two scholars, uh, one a Straussian, uh, Harry Jaffa, and then Mel Bradford, who was like a, you know, a, a traditional conservative. And Jaffa was trying to claim equality with a capital E as being a conservative principle. And Bradford saying equality with a capital E is a revolutionary principle. It is a God that can never be satisfied in its demands for sacrifice. It tears societies and institutions apart. So even if you innocently use the word equality, it has an internal dynamic of its own, whereby its demands become ever more radical over time. And I find that completely convincing. I assume you do too. Absolutely. I mean, once you open the box, you can't close it. We all like to think of this, well, we don't want to say that these people you know, don't have the same rights or political rights or these things. We know that people have been abused in American society. We know this is the case. But on the other hand, when you start talking about these terms, this term equality, and what does it mean? Well, this is, this is Lincoln opening that Pandora's box in 1863 at the Gettysburg Address. And this is why Lincoln is, Russell Kirk did include Lincoln in the conservative mind as a conservative. Nobody thought Lincoln was a conservative until Harry Jaffa started positioning himself that Lincoln is somehow a conservative and the, again, the idea of equality is conservative. But that's a, I, I, Bradford is completely right. It's a revolutionary principle that we have equality with a capital E, not just equality of rights as citizens, which I think that was been, had been developed over time in, in Great Britain, but equality in a different context and that that will tear society down. We saw it in France. We've seen it over and over again since the French Revolution, and we're seeing it now. I mean, this is exactly what's happening in modern America, and it's, it's, uh, it's dangerous. It's dangerous for the structure of society. It's dangerous for politics. It's dangerous for, for people and how they interact with each other. I mean, it's not a very, um, it, it's not a conservative principle in, at all, and, and of course, I would say it's, um, it's a destructive principle. I would add that Kirk also refused to count Hamilton among conservatives. That's he said, right, because, because of Hamilton's big tinkering program, this, this guy is not a conservative. And yet, needless to say, the modern conservative movement therefore says Hamilton is a conservative. I mean, it's just, it's just hopeless. Uh, last thing for this episode, I know what your answer is, but I want to hear the rationale behind it. Where do you come down? You must get a lot of people who approach you and say, the Constitution was a coup and was illegitimate the way it was ratified, stuff like that. How do you respond to that? Well, I would say it's not. I mean, um, the people of the states could decide if they wanted to join this new document or not. Certainly we had, look, we had these delegates sent to Philadelphia 
they were given a certain task, and that was to amend the Articles of Confederation. We know they didn't do that. And this was brought up even in the, in the ratification period. Well, these people had no authority to do this. So they wrote this, this document. It didn't have to be ratified. You could Everybody could have rejected it, and we wouldn't have had it. But the people of the states decided they were going to do it. The states themselves essentially decided they were going to agree to this document. And we know that you could have not agreed to it. I mean, North Carolina didn't initially. Rhode Island didn't. And so those two states could have operated independently forever long they needed to. So it wasn't a coup. You could make the argument that somehow the state seceded from the Articles of Confederation and formed a new government. And this is certainly, this was brought up. Again, even James Wilson brought this up. As part of the Declaration, we have a right to alter or abolish our former system of government. So this is essentially what we're doing. It's a revolutionary principle in many ways. But we we have this Articles. It's not working for us, we don't think. So we're going to create this new government, and this is where for our safety and happiness, and this is what we're going to do. So I would say it's not a coup. I would say it's legitimate because the people of the states did it, and that's that's good enough for me. I mean, and but on the other hand, then the people of the states have a right to change that government. Again, this is again this is where the declaration comes back into play. If we have a right to alter or abolish our government, well, that means we can secede from the government. That means we can change the government. These are, and it's not just vote better or vote this this next guy in there who's going to be just as bad as the guy we just had in there. I mean, this this is uh, ridiculous. It's insanity to think that's going to change anything. So we we have to go back to those principles of the founding generation. And that is, if your government's not working, you can change it. You can change it in radical ways if you want to. You can change it by simply abolishing it. I mean, abolishing the government. They believed you could do that. So I would say that um, that argument is based on a little bit of a misunderstanding of of what actually happened in, in 1787 and 1788 and and not understanding this this process by which the constitution was was ratified. All right, we're going to stop there and I'll tell people that I've got the book linked at tomwoods.com slash 1912, The Jeffersonian Tradition by Brian McClanahan. Brian with an O. You should also be listening to the Brian McClanahan show and just, and you know, re- you're never going to go wrong reading one of Brian's many books. So, Brian, I'll look forward to talking to you again tomorrow. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it. All right, folks, let me update you on where I'm going to be because I have a bunch of speaking events coming up, the first of which is at Porkfest, the Porcupine Freedom Festival held every year in New Hampshire. I'm told that it is sold out for the first time ever, that they've had more signups, more people registering for Porkfest than ever before. So it's going to be a great event. So if you are planning to attend, then I hope you'll Come to one of my sessions. I'm speaking from the main stage, and then I have some breakout sessions that I'm doing, and I'd love to say hello and meet some of you folks who are out there listening. Then in July, it's Freedom Fest, which normally is held annually in Las Vegas, but this year it's in Rapid City, South Dakota, and it's going to be a wonderful time. Dave Smith is hosting the entire event, and the Saturday of Freedom Fest, which is July 21st through 24th, is Tom Woods Day. It is officially dubbed Tom Woods Day. I have several panels and events going on that day. It's going to be absolutely fantastic. So I hope to, again, to meet some of you there. Young Americans for Liberty is having a big event in Kissimmee, Florida on August 7th, and I will be speaking there. October 2nd, Fairfax, Virginia. I'll be speaking alongside Michael Rechtenwald, Scott Horton, Maj Touré, Sean Rittenauer, Michael Bolden, and Dave Smith all of whom have been guests on the Tom Woods Show. We're going to have a great time there. Then October 16th, of course, is the 2000th episode of the Tom Woods Show, and we're going to have a huge event in Orlando, and I hope you will attend. It's going to be great fun, and it doesn't cost you a cent. The details about the event can be found at TomWoods2000.com. That's where you register for the event. As I said, it doesn't cost you anything, but do please register at TomWoods2000.com. And then the following week, I'll be speaking also in Florida at the annual Supporters Summit of the Mises Institute. So lots of things coming up. I'm going to post all these on a finally updated events page on my website. It's tomwoods.com slash events. I'll see you tomorrow. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit tomwoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. Like the sound of The Tom Woods Show? My audio production is provided by Podsworth Media. Check them out at podsworth.com.